Welcome everyone, thank you for attending. I'm John Ellis, I'm the Operations Director for the Institution. And today's speakers are Alistair, who's the Director General, and Paul, who's President of the Institution. And, and today they're going to talk about code commenting, uh, the pros and cons, and whether you should or whether you shouldn't, the camera. And uh, hand over to Alistair and Paul. Thanks, John. Are you going to kick off, Paul? <laughs> well, what I what I will say is, um, I think over the the years that I've been involved in software development, I've moved from sort of one edge of the spectrum right across um, to the other edge. And at one time, I was um, I was <laughs> I used to do I think more more comment than code at one point. But um, as the years have progressed, I've um, I've moved across doing less and less commenting until really uh, I take the stance of of clean coding now. Where if I if I had to sum it up very briefly, I would say anything that's in addition to coding standards, I I view as a as a failure. So if you if you can't express it in code, it is a failure. And I'm not saying comments um, are bad because there's lots of cases where you do need to comment. But my point of view is you should keep it to a minimum and treat it as a code smell. So if you see lots of comments, you should look at the comments and see if you can improve the code to get rid of the comments. Yeah, I, I think I, I would largely agree with sort of the, the idea of sort of uh, keeping code, uh, well, make, making code read properly. That's that's really important. But uh, the Marmite, I think, that is between us is probably that I still advocate sort of bannering around the edges of, 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 of code particularly, because I find it, it actually makes the navigation much easier in the in the code file. But I know um, when we've because in mean, some of these discussions for the audience, we, we, we should perhaps say that have, have happened in the past in, in pubs, dare I say it, with, with uh, Paul and myself. Um, and, and we've had some some interesting ribald remarks between us about things. But uh, no, I, I, I certainly think that um, uh, bannering is still has has some importance, and particularly in terms of things like, um, you know, not, not necessarily code, code from a code perspective, but um, copyright perhaps. I don't know what you feel about that, Paul. Oh yeah, I mean that that comes into coding standards. So um, yeah, any legal stuff that needs to be put at the top of the source file, definitely. Um, you know, it, it um, you you need to protect your work or the or the company's work. So yeah, that 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 is um, that is needed. I think. Um, I mean, I, I'll tell you what I used to do years ago. I used to write um code in say pseudocode and then um uh, make a blank line under the first line of pseudocode and write the implementation and then go down each line of pseudocode doing that type of thing and that was that was my sort of mindset of how thoroughly i wanted to comment code and now of course i see that as redundant commenting because if your code is like prose I it is so readable. It's it 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 it's so easy to read by anyone by yourself and anyone else. Then obviously comments are redundant and are, are, and and then they become noise, which distracts you from the code it, itself. But I, I I agree there. Um, I mean we we had a little chat last night and we both you know agreed to things like um, it's it's very difficult to encode domain knowledge in any particular programming yeah. language. So th that is certainly one case where you, you need to comment code. And um, I think you give a good example, Alice, there. Um, yeah, I, 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 in a number of routines that I've I've written, there is one, one library in particular which comes to mind, which uh, to someone who's not used to um, astronomy, um, may may find it rather difficult to get to grips with. And I basically I was developing very simple. Well, no, they weren't very simple, but they were routines to calculate sunset and sunrise, which uh, is, is based on you know the astronomical mathematics, shall we say. Um, so 
that code is incredibly impenetrable if you don't actually understand the basic root, you know, basic concepts behind that. So that particular uh, file is heavily documented with with notes about the mathematics behind it, so that hopefully uh, a regular developer who perhaps isn't a mathematician um, would actually sort of be able to pick their way through it. I think the acid test um, has always got to be that someone else coming fresh to the the source can actually understand what it is that's trying to be achieved. Um, so another practice that I that I have when I'm when I am bannering, I always almost without exception will put at the beginning of a class what the purpose of the class is just a simple statement of a couple of sentences at the most because I think you know as most people probably do in this room that a class should actually do you know one set of jobs basically so I, I, I spell out what I think it should be doing but like you I, I also believe that as you develop code. I, 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 I've lectured in the past, and I've, I've really made students sit down with a thesaurus, which irritated them no end, to come up with good names for uh, classes and methods within those classes, because it helps the code be self-documentary. Um, and something you, you you did say when you were talking about the pseudocode and the way that you used to write code, um, one of the things, and I'm sure you've probably come across, and I, I suspect lots of people in the room will have come across, is when you're reviewing someone else's code, you sometimes come across um, historic artifacts in code, which no longer <laughs> actually bear any relevance whatsoever to the code. You, you spend hours thinking, well, why did he comment that? And what is he trying to achieve here? Or, you know, and you, you get quite... Um, quite and that's, the, and that's the danger of of comments as well, because they're thing, not yeah. needed for either compilation or interpretation. Um, you can just leave them and they can get out of date and in fact become misleading. Yes, yeah, I, I think that 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 is a, a real risk. And I'd have to put my hand up and say that so when I review some of my own code, um, you know, I, I do come across things where I think, oh, I should have changed that comment. Um, so there are there are distinct dangers. But so I have drifted in a similar direction to yourself as stripping out uh, extraneous comments. Um, but I still I still think the banners are really quite important. It, it, when I was lecturing, it was very, very difficult um, with students who were basically cutting code for the first time for anybody else in their lives. Um, but by actually getting them to lay the code out may, meant that the the files were very easy to read. Um, and you could tell whether the student was a was actually writing reasonable code or not, almost by how well they they bannered, um, because they were either being consistent and laying things out properly, or it was just a mess and they really weren't thinking things through and there was lots of inconsistencies. Um, but something you mentioned to me last night, which I I think is really interesting, is at the top of my files, I often will always will have a, a sort of section of, uh, you know, last edits by whom. Uh, and you mentioned that, uh, uh, you now rely on on source repositories to, to provide that documentation. Um, I mean, I'm a more of an occasional developer than, than you, but I, I can see the benefits of that. Um, but then, you know, things like subversion, I think you, you can get it to actually start inserting last update dates with various triggers and things. Um, but you, you were mentioning also prettifying code, weren't you, when, when checking into a, a repository? Yeah, I mean, I'm a big advocate of um, a, a really thorough build process. So um, one of the things, of, and this comes into coding standards as well, is um, as as part of the um, the cycle that when you know when code's reviewed, but before it's uh, committed to the the main branch or whatever development branch you're in, that it goes through series of gates. Code review is one, but one of them will will go through um, um, a tool that'll make sure that standards have been uh, adhered to, and that could be um, a code prettifier. So it it doesn't really matter if the developer has, as say, as as used three spaces or two spaces or whatever. Um, you know, it's put into the standard um, company or organizational format. So the code looks consistent, whatever source file you open, you don't get any unexpected surprises. Yeah, I, that, that, that is um, an interesting insight, I think. Um, I, I certainly would, would, would adopt that, I think. If, um, from from my own practice, um, 
But I think uh, so just coming back to one of the other comments that I made about commenting and, and the copyright issue is that there have been a number of cases where, you know, outright theft of source code has has uh, been uh, rumbled by spelling mistakes being copied lock, stock and barrel from, from comments, which obviously you can't do in the code because it will have uh, been picked up by the compiler. Um, so I don't, I don't know what your thoughts are in, in protecting code, Paul. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, nearly all code I've worked on has a as you say a banner at the top where it lays out um, um, the copyright quite often it'll say who the original author what what the end the intent was um, and and to you know to some degree that definitely is is um, is worth doing um, I used to be dreadful for putting attributions and lists of what changes had been done, dates and and and, and what functions had been changed. But but of course, over the years, it it adds a massive amount to the the source file. And of course, with modern version control tools, when you when you check it in, you can do lots of annotation, so it knows the the author, it knows what code has been changed and you know you you go into most of these tools and click on um, um something that um, has been changed and it'll show you all the change lines so you you don't you don't really need to do that list at the top of the source file anymore and um i'll come back to my thing about noise um i've, I've come to the the conclusion that um if i was reading um an article in the magazine i've seen lots of stars or you know, hash hash signs and God knows what. It would really put me off from from reading the article. And I, I my my view is that you should treat um, code like prose. It should mm. be as easy to read as prose, and it should there shouldn't be anything that distracts you from reason reading it as well. Yeah, no, I I, I would I would very much agree with that. I mean, my own practice is, uh, has evolved like yours in many respects, in the sense that. Uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm very keen on making sure the code reads properly. Like and and you know again, we, yeah. again something else we mentioned last night was that you know I've got a very simple rule I suspect a lot of developers have, which is just to keep things to one screen full. Yes. And, you know I get tetchy if I have to start scrolling, um, and because I banner, therefore it has to be quite small and concise. Um, because the yeah, banner. I've, Strange enough, I've I've written about that in the past because there's there has been some research done on that, and uh, one of the things that they found was um, you need to keep any routine to a size of a screen full, and 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 that's whatever. I mean, different developers have different size screens, different size fonts, and so on. Yeah. But the the whole point of it is you should be able to read and comprehend it without scrolling, because as soon as you scroll you tend to lose some focus and you've got to pick the focus back up again you know you may have focus on the top line you've got to scroll down to the bottom line it's it's that sort of staggering that doesn't help comprehension so if you can fit a routine onto a screen it makes it so much easier to read yeah yeah i i certainly agree and and i i, I have a um another rule which actually is quite antiquated and, and just looking at uh, Giles's comment in the in <laughs> in the chat about nice big wide screens um, I'm going to feel quite embarrassed that the reason that I've settled on 90 as the character limit is because of uh, way back when with dot matrix printers on A4 pieces of paper so uh, that that seemed to have uh, carried through and been my mandate for for, for our, our uh, code standards within the firm but um, I I I have an anecdote which is is worth sharing because uh, I remember distinctly. I, I can't remember the student's name, which is quite uh, appropriate, probably. Um, but uh, did have a, a a terrible piece of code which was causing them no end of problem, and uh, they couldn't see what the bug was. And they asked me to have a look at it, and and I looked at it for quite a while, and I thought, well, I can't see what the bug is either. Um, and then I suddenly realised that there was a load of text which I had to scroll sideways for, um, and yeah, that was that was the problem. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, it's a silly, silly little thing, but it really helps if you've got everything in front of you um, and it's it's self-documenting. And again, something else we, we discussed about our, our, our various practices, but I think the, the real need to have sort of what I would call uh, guard expressions where you throw exceptions in, say, C-sharp or VB.net uh, at the beginning of a routine just to check that the, uh, 
the parameters are correct. And I think um, I've seen lots of code where where people will the error message is, you know, basically. Not right. Invalid <laughs> parameter. Invalid parameter, um, which is about as useless as it really gets. And it's it's an obvious uh, opportunity to comment in what the parameters should should perhaps be um, and, and give some feedback that way. And um, I also quite often will use assertions at the end of function calls to make sure that the return parameters are in in range as well. And that also helps. Um, and something we didn't mention, um, I'm again, modern practices evolving away perhaps from commenting, but you know, with test driven development, the actual test framework actually says a lot about what you expect the thing to do. Oh, um, yes. Well, behavior develop, develop, um, driven development, things like tools like Cucumber and so on, mm -hmm. they actually, the tests tell you what they're expecting. Yeah, yeah. So I, I you know, I, I think, um, yeah, there, there is there is a development within within uh, our professional practices, which is driven by newer technologies. I mean, mm. I, I, you know, I remember when I first started cutting code. Um, I did a piece at, at, at university in Fortran. I can't remember what it was for for the life of me, but um, that that had to be submitted to the compiler overnight on the mainframe, um, which you know horrendous in comparison to the you know the modern environments that we've got today. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah. The, but the comments are in. I don't know. I'm, the Marmite practice, I think, that I've got is is bannering because I do think it it helps move through files quickly. But picking up on your earlier comment about you know if you're doing an article or something like that, I would strip the banners out in most cases because they're, they're they're not relevant to the reader. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, the things that I can think of where. Um, comments are quite useful. I've, I've often I've used libraries which you don't have the source code to. You just have the interface. It may be a DLL or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, you, 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 you know, you've read the manuals or whatever, the readme files and it doesn't work, but you found a fix, a workaround to get mm -hmm. it to work. Yeah. And it may be like you have to initialize, you have to set some sort of um, variable, then call it initialize on the class and then you have to set this variable again now in code you know you've you've it doesn't make any sense when you read really why is he doing that but that's the that works now somebody might be you know tempted to take one of those um assignments out but of course then it won't work so that is where um you've got to put in a comment to say this is a, a fix this is a workaround to get although this doesn't make sense this works don't take it out yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely agree. So, sort of, you know, well, we mentioned domain specific knowledge. I think also sort of dealing with other developers' um, accidents is, is is probably probably important, isn't it? Because it mm. would be very easy in a code review to strip out those double initials oh, yeah. because it just makes no sense. And then you spend hours trying to work out why. Why it doesn't it, work anymore. <laughs> it doesn't work and reinvent the wheel and rediscover what's what's wrong with it. Yeah, I mean, th some other things I can think of are um, to do's, and I, I don't. Again, I don't like to see many to do's, but to uh, to do's are quite useful when you're, you know, working in in an agile. You're developing something. Yeah. You you try to get this, deliver this, you know, piece of work, but you may not use the most optimum solution, but you want to, you know, get it working so you can at the end of the sprint you can show it to to you know the um the product owner or you, you're doing a show and tell or whatever um and then you you at some point you'll need to come back and and you you need to do a proper job of it and so to do's are quite useful for that type of thing but again you don't want to get a plethora of, of them um it's it's you know because that's going into technical debt but th that's that's quite useful and and the other thing that comes to mind is things like um, tools like Java Doc. If you're if you say write in a library that's going to be for public domain or whatever, you want to um, document the interface to it. And um, Java Doc is quite useful for doing or other tools. There's lots of other tools de yeah. depending on the the development environment or language for for creating those um, th that type of documentation. So don't don't get me wrong. I'm not against um, uh, commenting. I just like to keep it to a to a minimum. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, we, we I'm, I'm primarily a .NET developer, so sort of using Sandcastle type 
stuff um, is 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 really useful. Um, and and a lot of the if if there's going to be in method documentation, um, I often use use either directly in the in the uh, source file itself, or in fact you, you can use um, obviously a sort of uh, XML reference or references to include an XML file with the the documentation, which is what I tend to do. I tend to push the that sort of heavy documentation that I want to appear in the ultimate um, help files for the uh, library. I tend to push that out into into some separate XML files within the project, um, keeping just the, the really important stuff, because I found uh, that actually if you document the routines well with the view of producing the help file, you end up with a, with hiding the real code in, in just little snippets in between all the all the sort of comments, which is just too heavy. Um, so it breaks that rule that, w that we both really agreed on, uh, on making sure that you can see the whole code in a single screen space or as, with little scrolling as possible. Um, so I, I don't know if there is a potential better solution to that than, than what we do at the moment or not, but I think pushing it into a, a, an external file um, is probably best. Um, yeah, I mean, I think mixing languages in with us within a source file is not good and 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 bob bob martin of clean code yeah. hates hates uh, people who put html in into source files to pretty to pretty fight it and so on um so um yeah uh, i i mean strangely enough i don't um go down bob martin's route 100 percent, but i'm i'm i would say i'm over 95 percent um agree with what he writes about mm -hmm. uh about clean code. Um, the other thing that is is quite useful, where where comments can can be extremely useful, is where um, they signal the the original intent or design of the way this code is written. So it doesn't it doesn't become redundant by you know just echoing the implementation, but it gives you the I, the reason behind what you're yeah. doing or why you're doing and i think they are the most telling comments you can come across yeah i i i uh, uh, really do advocate that i mean quite often if I, if i've got a class as i said earlier i'll, I'll specify what the purpose is in a in a, a only two to three um sentences but if if it's a really involved class which has got some you know really important workload which may not be obvious immediately to the to the person coming to it next um then then i will comment heavily about that um and and, and i think give the the context behind the class and how i how i envisage it being used um to to to, to explain that to to the next developer i think one one of the things which is perhaps important behind commenting is is when when developers develop if that's not too much of a contortion of English, but they they often uh, don't think about themselves working with others and people who will come to their code many moons later, which is, is so important because I, I think it's really important that people understand what the intent of the code actually was in the beginning. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm um, um, just having a little look, I've made a few a, a few notes just to make sure we cover all all the bases. Um, now, something you said last night was quite interesting is that you tend to put um, comments at the end of a block, closing comments. <laughs> yeah, that that that's probably another piece of marmite. Um, <laughs> but um, I, again. Um, when moving between routines, when you've got the sort of um, well, VB.net, for instance, or sort of N function or the N sub or N class, whatever, I, I often will just do apostrophe in the name of the class because it, it does just help work out when scrolling backwards and forwards between the whole source file, um, in my opinion, um, what I'm looking at, what, what the N function actually re re refers to. Um, in an ideal world, in an ideal world, of course, um, we should be able to see the beginning and the end of the routine in the screen. With a class, that's always not going to well, most often is not going to be the case, is it? No. So, um, um, uh, what Bob Martin says about sort of like um, people who do a lot of um, commenting, like uh, he calls it N brace comments, is his, his view on this is that um, 
routines should be shorter so that you don't need them. So you can see the lineup of braces or, you know, block begin ends or whatever. Yeah, no, I, 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 I have some sympathy with that position, I think. But there is part of me which just sees that yeah, the the importance of consistency. So by uh, so I, I suppose I've got myself caught in my own thinking in the sense that while I might strip away the the end functional, the end sub um, comment, uh, if I could see it on the screen, I would I'd want to make sure that I was doing that consistently across all source files in the project. And uh, as Giles mentioned earlier, with different size screens, who knows when I've got, you know, <laughs> two very <laughs> wide screens in front of me, maybe my third wide screen when that comes along, um, sort of, <laughs> you know, um, how wide do we, you know, how wide do we go and how deep do we go? And so I, I, I'm just reluctant to stop that practice and, <laughs> and therefore just do it. And I think, to be honest, when I do write code, I just see these banners and comments as being part of the syntax. It's yes. Become so part of my thinking. Yes, so, I, I, and I can, I can, I can understand that um, because I used to be there. I used to be hmm. in that position, and um, I would do things like um, I'd use position markers. So you know, say you had some functions that had um, similar behaviour, you you you'd see like a, 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 a like a little banner at the top of them saying you know functions to do X, Y, or Z or whatever, and then a um, uh, an end of uh, section marker almost, you know, mm. lots of little stars going across. But again, like I said, um, I, I don't do that anymore. Mm. But I can much. see, I can see the reason because I used to do it myself. I can see the reason for them. Yeah, I mean, a lot, a lot of development um, tools and IDEs have have sort of macro type capabilities to expand your banner. Yes. Which yeah, is great. You know, I don't have to think about. Well, it you much. can. You think you know a lot of people use Visual Studio. You got the the plus and the minus to close yeah. and and expand sections. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I mean, I, I'm just noticing in the in the the chat that uh, Tim's saying they're struggling with the concept of a routine in 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 one screen. My, if if I see some code which is going beyond the depth of my my regular coding screen, I I feel that or well, I get an itch to to try and um, move codes into into sort of further subroutines. I mean, I don't know how, how you how you would deal with that, Paul. Yeah, um, what, I, what I tend to do is at the highest level, I would get all the um, if I if I had a massive um, routine and I wanted to refactor it, then, you, you know, forget putting aside things like unit tests and God knows what. But let's assume you've got everything in place to make sure you don't you don't break the code. My way of, of of approaching this would be to 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 look at pieces of code, which is um, I think the the refactoring um, recipe is break out into a function or whatever. So you look at code within the um, the function and say, well, that should be in its own function. Break that out, and um, you should have everything at the same level. So um, you know, if you if you're looking at um, say a routine, say cal calculate total pay, you you you'd break down that um, into functions, which was calculate basic pay, calculate overtime pay, and so on and so on and mm. so forth. And then you could drill into each of those functions. So at the highest level, it's speaking to you in English. And as you go down and drill down into a function, they it may be called in further functions itself. But what you do is you've you've turned it into prose rather than it's all in your face. Yeah, I mean, I, I if, if I'm honest, I, I quite often write code where I just start the blank screen and just code um, without too much forethought. Um, so uh, to, to Tim's point, what, what I'd often end up doing is I'll, I'll start I'll start with uh, in in sort of vb.net with uh, an apostrophe, you know, initialization, and then I'll have my initialization sort of block of lines. Then I'll, you know, to your sort of calculate pay, I'd, I'd prep basic pay, and I'd have a few lines which would do that, and then I'd have the overtime pay, and then whatever other things that PAY and inland revenue insist on in, in that sort of routine uh, that, that might crop up. And then I sit back and I think, you know, crumbs. This is now, you know, screen after screen after screen after screen. And it was at that point that probably those initial sort of comments at the top of each of those blocks, I would then just replace with a, an appropriately named private function. Yeah. Method. 
to, yeah. to actually so, collapse so, it in, which is, which is what you're ah, that's what yeah. you're doing then. You're you're actually turning comments into code in a yeah, way, exactly. or getting rid of comments. Yeah. So I, I I would agree with your the basic concept, certainly within the routine, that a comment should be there because it adds something to the understanding of what's going on. Um, I know my banners don't, and that is an acronym which we discussed last night, and we we, we both. Um, you, well, you mentioned uh, a, a really ancient set of manuals, which, uh, what was it, uh, Turbo? Turbo um, Pascal Database the, the tool, Toolbox. The, to, the Toolbox, yeah, which was yeah. A, a very uh, set of uh, routines way back when, which shows our age. In the 80s, yeah. 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 <laughs> and I, I still have those books fondly and, on the and, 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 and me as well. <laughs> uh, but, but the code that was in, because they provided the source code, which was unusual back then, I think. And uh, the, we, we mentioned that they were using the star banners. That probably actually had quite an influence on what I was. Yeah, I was well, my, my, myself also, you know, I looked at those old Turbo Pascal libraries and I, I copied the way that they, that Boland, who were the makers of it at the time, did did that. And so, um, you know, that, that was part of my evolutionary uh, journey of uh, of laying out source files. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, mine too. John mentioned. Yes, in, in I've the, just noticed that, that he's about of, dead code and or, te or code that's used for testing. Sure, you, you, oh, I would use debug flags or, or yes. whatever the ID presents to, to, to switch them off because it does actually help understanding as to why I had those um, debug lines in in the first place, what it was I was trying to, to shrive from the, yes. from the, the code. Um, so I. I would be. I'm not sure I'd comment them out. I, I would use switches basically to to eliminate them. And funny enough, um, I was I was just going over this morning that in I was looking at clean code just to remind me of what Bob Martin said about, it, and he said exactly the same thing. You should be using switches, and uh, if code is not routinely used, it should be stripped out. That would be his policy. Yeah, I, he, I, he looks. He, he he views it as dead wood and. Um, it just clutters up, um, you know. It it adds to noise, so you should should if it's not being used, remove it. I mean, one of his points is somebody else in the development team may look at it and say, "Well, why is it commented out? Um, can I can I safely take it out?" And then and they're not in. They never show up, because you never want to break anything, do you? Oh, no, so there is that you're, reluctance. Yeah. you're reluctant to actually touch it. So, you know, the person who's commented out really. Unless there's some fantastic reason for leaving it, should 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 remove it. Yeah, no, I I I I'd agree in that. I mean, I think uh, again, it comes to working as as part of a team and and also thinking about developers in the future who will visit the code is is so important. Um, but I yeah, I mean, we, we, what we're really saying is that we should dispense with code with, with comments. If we can rely on more modern techniques that are, are there, which actually supplant it and don't lead to redundancy, which can actually when one part of the redundancy, so that the, the code most often is changed and the comments aren't, that, that that then leads to complete confusion because the comment says one thing and the code yeah. manifestly does something very, very different. Um, yeah. Red redundant is one thing. Misleading is is way, way worse. Yeah. Yes, indeed, indeed. Um, yeah, but I, yeah. So I, the same, same. Going back with with, with sort of that the, the the using the re, the repository as a tool for um, self documenting. There is an interesting thing around copyright, which is um, if you've got the code's source evolution captured in your repository, that is a very good evidence to show that the, you own the copyright because you can see the evolution. So again, you could you could theoretically pull out quite a lot of the, the, the stuff that I've got at the top of files. Um, I don't know, but it also depends, of course, with with the tools that you're developing. We've been tending to talk here about um, so sort of basically the sort of Visual Studio or Java equivalent world, but you've got other tools where code is written. So for instance, in in sort of visual, uh, sorry, in um, Microsoft Office, you know, um, access and things like that, um, where, where the code is actually embedded, it's much more difficult to to perhaps put that sort of stuff into uh, version control in the same way that you might 
regular files within a within a project. Um, I have a comment. I have a, I have a question for you, which I don't know how how relevant it is, Paul. But how do you comment your if you ever get involved in writing SQL? Yes, um, and and that is the biggest one of the biggest problems is because I know that there's all sorts of tools out there, but I've never seen one tool that is as uh, almost as good as um, uh, you know if, if you if you write in say in in Java or C sharp um, a, a code repository tool that's as good as that for for SQL. I've never I've never seen one. Yeah, I I haven't. Um, and if somebody comes up with it, I'm sure they'll make a fortune. <laughs> yeah, um, it would be it would be good. I would use it if there was. Um, but yes, it, SQL is does present a problem. And there are there are lots of edge cases where, where projects have have things which are ancillary, aren't they? So and it's difficult sometimes to, yes. to know how, how to document them. Um, I've just noticed Tim's comment. I know it's it's not it's not quite on the. Um, the, the code commenting, but it may be worth addressing. Um, Tim says, struggling with the concept of a routine in one screen surely depends on the complexity of the routine, i.e. what it what it's actually doing. And and I would, um, I mean, my my point of view on this is, you should. Um, it doesn't matter how complex it is, at the highest level, it should it should read like prose, so it should be very simple. So as we was, we were talking about, say the the calculate pay one, you break it down into very simple steps and then each one of those steps will, will say will be a method or a function and then each one of those will have its own simple steps and when you get down to the you know the quite complicated stuff what what tends to happen is that um if you've got um a, one particular algorithm or formula say that you're relying upon and it's it's very complex if you wrap even if it's only one line wrap it up in a in a function with a really good name and it's it's centralized in one place so it doesn't matter about the complexity in reality as long as that's well tested people you know know that it should produce this you've got a simple name for it and that can be called time and time again mm. i mean what's what's your views on that I, I i i would agree absolutely with what you said to be honest um that would be the approach that that i would take so, yeah, definitely. <laughs> oh, I don't, don't know whether anyone else wants wants to let us start thinking about coming coming in. I, I was going to say there's one, another piece of Marmite that I haven't mentioned, which again is probably a prisoner of my own thinking, is that I, I will, at the beginning of a method, I will declare my variables up top and I will comment them by adding a, any extra sort of stuff that isn't actually in the name of the the variable because i i think like you paul I, I want my variable to be very obvious from the name as to what it's doing but sometimes just a little bit of extra information i i, I think actually helps but um, it it shows my pascal origins in the sense of declaring stuff at the front um i my own practice within sort of declarations within blocks if the language allows it i, I tend not to um I, I, I think I tend to have this sort of um, view that I like to know what I'm going to be faced with in this next couple of lines of code. You know, what, what is it that I'm playing with? Where, what are the variables? And it, it's interesting. I had this discussion um, with a lawyer in a, in a very different context um, because uh, there are two schools of thought in declaring definitions within legal contracts. Um, some lawyers will, will have all their definitions up front and others like to de define definitions in line, as it were. So when they define uh, uh, you know what what uh, um, a defect is in a in a contract about software um they'll actually perhaps within the clause which defines what a defect is will then bracket defect in bold saying this is the definition for this term in the rest of the contract um which is a similar sort of you know do, where where do you declare and where do you comment and the, the, and the again there's there's two points of view in it there's a it, there's a point of view yeah. that you create a glossary where you can you can keep on looking up Time and time again, you mention it once, and you can you can go to a glossary and see the or oh, there's the thing where you say where you do everything in in line. But I pick up on your point about um, variables and the modern preference is to is to is is to put them in scope at where they use. So if you've got an, an inner loop or something like that, and you need um, a variable there, you 
you you declared it within that scope rather than say at the at the function scope. Mm. Um, I, I don't have I don't have any strong opinions on that whatsoever. But like you, um, you know, I I was a big I was a big fan of Pascal. So um, I, I used to love um, you know under your var laying out all your variables there. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I, I see Mike Mike Peters um, poking some fun at COBOL programmers. I've never programmed in COBOL, so <laughs> he can't be referring. Oh, to you me. used to have used to have the, the divisions like the data division and so, and yeah. everything was up front. So yeah. Um, yeah, you'd have all your pictures and God knows what. I remember those days. I've I've, I've only looked at COBOL source in the past. I've never cut any COBOL code or run anything for a COBOL compiler in my in my life. So I'm totally guiltless for that one. Ah, <laughs> uh, right. Yeah, I, what you were saying about perhaps we should open this up now and see if um if anybody else would like uh, to put in the uh the the five penneth worth in or whatever. Yeah, I did see that. Uh, Giles was asking about your thoughts on tools like Swagger and Redoc for documenting API code. Well, I I don't know those too well, but um, I I have used um, different tools. I've used uh, used Java uh, Java Doc. I'm trying to remember. There was a tool with was it Doxygen or something like that. I, it's such a long time ago since I've I've done this. Um, but um, I, I'll just go back to the point that if you've got something that you, you say you're producing a library commercially or you're doing open source or whatever, then those type of tools are excellent for um, for doing that. And and just just somebody who doesn't know about Java Doc, you've got an at um, use the at symbol, and then you've got keywords like author and so on, and they can be picked up by a tool that goes through the source code and then produce documentation and extracts. So you'll have at parameter, whatever, as as uh, Alistair was saying about you know documenting parameters. So it's a it's a it's a great way of producing documentation from the source code. Yeah, yeah, I I I, I think doing that is really really very powerful, and I, I and certainly within the net world there, there is this the, the idea of embedding xml type commentary in, into the source but i i always find that that actually just blocks the source out so much uh, i wish there was a, a, a happy medium the idea of collapsing sections of code i i and and potentially comments is great but um unless i've missed it in in the visual studio id you, you can't sort of just make it all just collapse and you know get rid of all the source comments in one go and make them disappear for the moment because i want to look at the code rather than the, 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 yeah, and and that's the and that's the proviso. If it, if it's for open source or for a you know a commercial library, if you're doing it in house, you've got the developers there. Why why you know why do they, they can they can go up to their colleague and say if they've got a question. I suppose it's mm. it's better to leave the code the code cleaner. Mm. Tim Tim's come back on a, a, another comment there about sort of uh, sort of setting out the, the plot for the uh, the method or. Or whatever routine he's writing with, starting with um, comments and then I guess fleshing them out. Tim, is that how, how you're doing it? Yeah, basically, I I start away with, with um, I know what the method is supposed to achieve. Um, so I I'm basically I'm writing notes. This is what I need to do. I need to get this from here. I need to do that with this, that, and the other. They're all comments, and then in between each of those, I then write the code that achieves what I've set out to do. Yeah, uh, quite quite often I've. I've done this before where um, I've been in the middle of something and I just in a blinding flash of genius write about three hours worth of code and come back to the following day and think, what the hell have I done? It works, <laughs> but I don't know how. We've all done that. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea what I've done, how I've done it, but it works, so I'm just leaving it. Um, but this way, I, 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 let's just say, I'll set out the plot first and then flush it out with the code. So at least when I come back to it in a couple of days time, I'm going, ah, yeah, I know what what process I followed or if I have to break off halfway through and go and do something else I can pick up where I left off because I've, I've got that train of thought in green in the comments in that method yes yeah. and I, I, I can see that working um, uh, and, and as I said at the, at the head at the beginning of this discussion it, that was the way I used to work years and years ago um, I used to do exactly exactly the same thing I think my my point of view uh, now is that um, uh, while you're working on it, 
that's fine. But when you're ready to commit, mm. minimise comments. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with what Paul has said. And I, I think my practice is, is around that. Although I, as, as time has gone on and test-driven development has, has become more to the fore, I, I now tend to write unit tests for any routine first. So I, I decide what the, what the thing is going to deliver and that contract mustn't be broken. Um, and I write tests to make sure that all the edge cases that that should fail definitely will fail. So that tends to to help me define what the outside of the the, the method is going to be. But I, I do find myself, Tim, doing something similar to you from time to time. If, if there is a routine, I'll just sort of put in uh, the basic ideas in uh, basic comments. But I, I would certainly strip them out and I would probably if if I started developing code and I started going down for more than one, two, three, four, five, six screens, then the itch to shove them all in all the bits of the code back into private um, functions to back up that that more public method is, is the way I would travel. Um, and um, what you said about unit tests is interesting because I always feel that um, a well-written unit test, besides testing the functionality of a particular piece of code, also sets out the documentation for it because yeah. it 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 it's documenting what you're expecting it to do and uh, how you should be using those particular calls or whatever yeah so that that's that's an interesting um observation again that idea that as new tools have come along and new ways of doing things that the amount of commenting that i certainly leave in code is, is in the the main source code has dropped what's interesting though i also document the unit um, oh yes, yeah, yeah. With with exactly what I'm trying to achieve, um, which which forms uh, an important part of the the spec, definitely. And in fact, I would say I, I'd most probably use more comments in in the unit tests yeah. source files than in the uh, in the implementation. Yeah, I I often I mean, and I if I find a bug, which I'm afraid to say I find far too many, um, I'll often go back and add a further. Um, unit testing or and, and comment exactly what it was, what the condition was that I was trying to get rid of here. Um, but I, I like that. I mean, I, I'm a real advocate of TTD because it, it it increases my own confidence that I haven't screwed up. And and perhaps being an occasional developer where uh, I'll write some code and then I'll go and do some business management and come back a couple of days later. Um, and I'm thinking, what the hell was I doing? And, and perhaps uh, like, like Tim was saying, I, I I don't do it quite so much, but when I was a, a younger coder, I quite often had some of my maddest and brilliantest moments um, <laughs> after midnight. And yes, uh, yes. I, I, I would code to the point where I was basically completely punch drunk, um, and and then and then I would start making big mistakes, um, and I knew that was the time to give up. Um, but test driven really helps defend against that because you, you you know when it when you've broken something else that you shouldn't have done. Yes, I I remember those uh, hours after midnight where I had some sort of brilliant idea. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> I'm not sure they were brilliant when I come back to it many years later. I've, I have occasionally looked at code I've written, you know, 20 years ago, and and I'm 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 marking the younger Alistair and thinking, nope, <laughs> that's not very good. <laughs> Have we got any more questions from anyone else? It's it's quiet as the grave. Um, interestingly, when you were talking about coding blocks being either a page size, I remember in one of my previous employments. I introduced a system whereby we analysed all the code we had to see about function sizes, procedure sizes, and we actually set ourselves, I think we actually set ourselves a 20 line limit per per routine. It wasn't in stone. And when we analysed our code, I think when we first did it, we were about 60%. And within about two or three years, we got that up to about 85% of yeah. the code. Um, once you can, as I said, once you can't see it on the screen or it doesn't fit on a page, uh, and also sometimes these routines just get everything that's going on, it gets too complicated. So if you can break it down, put it into an, another function, um, even if the one bit is just 
getting the data, doing the loop, and then calling out to the function to do the process, you you make it just more readable, which uh, I find quite good. Well, it's fun. I've just picked up on something you said there, John, which is so accurate about um, if it's on a page. Um, I I did um, my master's in computing around about 30 years ago, and uh, of course the guys that were were, were were teaching us were mainframe guys, and he always used to say the function should never be more than a, than one page, which I think he considered was 60 lines. Um, um, funny enough, I've got a book. I've only just started reading it because I was intrigued by the the title. I don't know if you can see that. Five lines of code. Yeah. Five oh, lines of code. Now, the guy who wrote this book uh, believes that you will you will have less bugs and uh, more comprehensible code if you stick to this rule of five lines of code, which basically what he's saying is uh, no routine should ever go over five lines of implementation, which it's it all it's almost like extreme ironing or something like that isn't it you can imagine i've got to, i've got to cut this function down to f somehow to five lines but um there are there are lots of um metrics out there that are used in in readability of code and um oh god i always forget the one with readability of english uh, what's the what's the well known one uh god Kincaid can, can there's Kincaid can... is one there's another one there's there's another one I always forget the name of it now but uh, basically um if you analyze prose like for example um if you take an article from the sun it's got a, a reading index of 12 which means that uh, anybody age 12 or over can can understand it um and it's quite obvious, you know, you want to make your your articles as easy to read as possible. And there's lots of little things that add up to make readability. One of them, we was talking about them, you know, how far should you go across on your column width? Mm. And it's one of the reasons why newspapers are split into columns is because if you had uh, an article go in the whole width of the broadsheet, when you flip back at the end of the line, to the left hand side, you would never know which line you were on because you could never keep track of it and it would it would disrupt your reading. And that's why you have columns. So um, it's easy to trace where you're going. And that that not only works in 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 prose, it works in um, programming as well. So the longer the lines are, the harder it is to read. So short lines and I mean, I always think of 80 rather than 90, Alistair. And the reason I think of 80 is, um, you know, in the years gone by, you had 80 columns of 25 rows. And so I, t I tend to put my hard marker on 80 rather than 90. I, I think, well, I, I probably started at 80 and then realised I could get it up to 90 with the dot matrix <laughs> printers. So <laughs> um, but, but yeah, there's lots of um, different metrics used. And, and one metric is the number of lines in a routine, which has been known for for many years. I mean, um, again, oh, my brain is gone. I can't think of the chap who did cyclometric, cyclometric complexity. What was the name of that computer scientist? Um, but he, he worked basically he looked at um, he looked at um, iteration and selection and he said they the most they the most complex things in programming um, the more iteration the more selection you've got in a particular you know volume of code the more complex it is and so what this is saying this five lines of code is if you can keep each routine less than five lines and you never have nested loops for example you've never have nested ifs so if you need a um a nested if you call a routine which has got the if in it so you're always calling um a routine if you get into that. and the routine then will have a, a damn good name so it'll say exactly what it does on the tin yeah yeah, yeah i think i think that's 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 incredibly important, that last point, Paul. But I, I think the five, for me, the five lines of code, I, I would modify it slightly to being the five five lines within the, what I would call the main body of the routine. 
because um, just thinking if you've got guard expressions above where you're throwing exceptions if parameters. Uh, yes, yes, so. that, 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 that that excludes <laughs> um, a, any yeah. um, pre and, and post check in, you know, to make sure that the uh, the input parameters are correct and then the contract that your output or your result is is correct. Yes, I, I, I agree. They they the implementation rather than uh, making sure that um you know the, the, it ex excludes defensive programming yeah yeah well thank you guys That's, uh, we've used an hour has anyone got any other questions they would like to ask perhaps before we sort of uh right wind up no nope. okay I, I first of all i'd like to thank alistair and paul it was very interesting uh, and also thank you to everyone that's attended today no problem, John. Thank you for uh, for hosting it, and thank you for everyone who's who's listened to uh, Paul and myself uh, warble about something we've warbled about <laughs> these times before. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Okay.